Good afternoon and welcome to the CDC Public Health Grand Rounds, both of you here. And there will be a sign-up sheet. So those from the Injury Center who are not here in person uh, will have a discussion about that later. But those of you who are here, very good to see you. I also would like to welcome many of those who are joining us via internet. And here is the web page where people can watch us basically through YouTube. Today's topic is traumatic brain injury. And before we launch into the session, I would like to take a couple of minutes and have a personal story of a young girl who has experienced traumatic brain injury being shared with you. It was January 10th, 2005. I was 17 years old and my high school basketball team was playing a varsity game and it was around the second quarter and I was going up for a rebound and as I came down um, the back of my head collided with the top of another girl's head. The next day, after the day I got hit, I went to school and I was really sick. I knew I had a concussion because I suffered through a concussion my seventh grade year. I had all the symptoms, dizzy nauseous. Um, I couldn't focus in school. I continued to play a second game after that and I passed out after the second game in the locker room. Basically I was bedridden in my house for about six months straight. I slept on the couch because of the light. We had to put dark shoes over the windows. Um, my mom and my sister had to help me walk around. Um, I lost my balance. I couldn't really get that back for quite a while. I didn't know it could get this bad. All athletes have a strong will, and since we're young, we know that we have to suck it up, suck things up, whether you know you sprain your ankle or you hurt your finger. You just go in the game and you shake it off and you don't complain, you don't cry. But this is a brain and head we're talking about, and you can't suck it up. So unfortunately, instead of missing a game, I missed the season. I miss sports for the rest of my life, and I miss out on a great life that I could have had. Athletes need to know, if you think you have a concussion, don't hide it. Report it. It's better to miss one game than the entire season. We actually have only three speakers today, but they certainly make up in quality for the five or four that we normally have, our own Dr. Lisa McGuire, Dr. David Wright from the Emory University, and Dr. Art Kellerman from Rand Corporation. And each one of them is, as you will see, be covering a different aspect of how we are dealing with traumatic brain injury. I would like to remind you that this is a course that qualifies for the continuing education credit. And for the first time now, we are going to be having Q&A session after you listen to the session, you should go to the web page, answer four of the five questions to be able to get the credit for this session. So just sitting and listening is not enough anymore. Um, I would also like to point out that as always, we are coordinating science clips with the topic of our grand rounds. And I would like to thank our colleagues from the Injury Center who have made the selection for this uh, week. Finally, this is a group of people that, as always, had to do some teamwork. So in this term, David actually got us all at the Emory, and, and we all dealt to see how the patients uh, deal with these really serious and life-threatening issues. And, and Nurse Tanya, or Nurse Jackie, was kind of watching aside and, and really had to give enormous amount of credit for these unbelievably uh, uh, wonderful and high-level professionals who have worked with me and, and tolerated a lot of little do this, don't do this, to make this what I hope is going to be, again, an outstanding session. Uh, I like to brag about the number of people that come and view this session because it's really not just the number of people in the auditorium. It's thousands of people, as you can see from this chart, who have been watching us live. And to be very specific, in the past couple of years that we have been doing this, we have had 329,751 people who have watched us electronically in some way, whether live or downloaded our sessions. That's a huge number of uh, people for a 
public health topic. To assure that we actually continue with the quality and with the interest that we have gotten so far, we are going to be taking a break. And after two years of doing this month after month, what we would like to do is we would like to do a little bit of reassessment. What is it that worked very well? What is it that needs to be improved? We would like to continue making this about science as the foundation of what we do, as the foundation of decisions that are being made and recommendations that stem from a lot of these decisions. We also would like to keep everything about practice and the excitement of putting some of these interventions in, in practice. But in the end, it really is all about you. Those of you who are either coming here in person or who are watching us throughout the country and worldwide at this point, what is it that motivates you to come here to listen to these sessions? And what is it that you take back from them that is useful for you in your work? So with that, just to give you a sense of what is coming in the next nine to 10 months. So like I said, we will be taking a break October and November, and then we have round up another series of what I think you will find extremely interesting topics as I have listed here. As it happens, we try to coordinate a lot of events and try to point out events that happen at the same time as our grand rounds. So just today, in our new winnable battle section, we have a year of assessment of what is it that has been done in a winnable battle se session. As you know, motor vehicle crashes are one of CDC's winnable battles. And I'm just going to read to you one sentence from that uh, uh, article that came today. In 2009, about 12,000 more injuries would have been prevented and about 450 more lives saved if all states had primary enforcement seat belt laws. And you will see that seat belt laws, motor vehicle crashes, and traumatic brain injuries are very much intertwined. Before we move to our spectacular speakers, we are going to move to our spectacular CDC director, who is not here today, but is going to provide his comments uh, that he has videotaped. About 1.7 million Americans have a traumatic brain injury each year. TBIs are caused by falls, motor vehicle crashes, firearms, and blast injuries, and the results can range from mild to severe. Some can result in lifelong cognitive impairment or even death. Severe TBIs affect families and communities and are preventable with primary prevention strategies, including helmet and seat belt use laws. When TBIs occur, early identification and management are key to minimizing secondary brain injury, while rehabilitation is key to regain function and minimize permanent disability. Implementing prevention strategies and responding to TBIs is complicated by the complex nature of TBI. No one strategy will address all risks or consequences of TBI. We need stronger injury surveillance, more use of existing primary prevention strategies, and research to expand our evidence base for prevention. The role of public health in reducing TBI includes key activities such as supporting surveillance, identifying best practices, implementing and dif disseminating effective intervention, and rigorously evaluating actions to see if we have the intended impact. This session will discuss TBIs, their burden, promising strategies to prevent and treat them, and many of the challenges we face moving forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Lisa McGuire from CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, and I'm gonna to talk to you this afternoon about the public health's role in severe traumatic brain injury, or TBI. The CDC defines a TBI as a brain injury that disrupts the normal functioning of the brain. It can be caused by a bump, a blow, or a jolt of the head, or also a penetrating head injury. There are at least one million TBIs sustained in the United States every year. These numbers underestimate the true burden of TBI, 
They do not include TBIs treated in non-hospital-based settings, such as a doctor's office or outpatient clinics. They also do not include TBIs that were sustained by military personnel that had been treated in either a military or Veterans Administration medical setting. To illustrate the magnitude of TBI in the military, the Department of Defense reported that more than 31,000 U.S. military personnel were diagnosed with a TBI in 2010. Finally, TBIs often go undiagnosed in the presence of other life sustained threatening conditions. At least one person sustains a TBI every three minutes in the United States. Males are more likely to sustain a TBI than females, and when males do sustain a TBI, they're three times more likely to die from that TBI than females are. CDC has estimated that 5.3 million people live with the long-term cognitive and psychological impairments or other long-term consequences associated with the TBI. Using lifetime estimates of cost of TBI in the U.S. for the year 2000 and adjusting for inflation, we estimate that the 2010 cost for TBI were $76.3 billion. Of that, $11.5 billion were due to direct medical costs and $64.8 billion are due to indirect costs such as lost wages, product productivity loss, and non-medical related expenditures. Now let's discuss the causes of TBI. Falls are the overall leading cause of TBI among the civilian population. For example, actress Natasha Richardson fell while skiing. This resulted in an epidural hematoma that caused her death. Motor vehicle crashes are the second leading cause of TBI and they're the leading cause of TBI-related deaths. TBIs account for nearly one-third of all injury-related deaths in the U.S. It's also important to note that TBIs do not occur in isolation. They may occur in combination with other injuries which may be serious or life-threatening. We will now look at the rates of TBI by age and cause. Falls are the leading cause of TBI. The rates are highest in children and older adults. Falls cause approximately 50% of the TBIs in children aged 0 to 14 years, and a little more than 60% of the TBIs in adults aged 65 years old and older. Motor vehicle, cause, motor vehicle crashes are the second leading cause of TBIs. However, motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of TBIs for teens and adults 15 to 34 years old. Males aged 15 to 24 years old and anybody who's aged 85 years old and older have the highest rates of TBI death for motor vehicle crashes. TBI severity is classified as mild, moderate, or severe. Following an injury, classification may be based on the length and depth of coma or altered consciousness, it also can be based on the anatomical description of the injury or the functional outcome. Dr. Wright will tell us a little bit more about this in his presentation. So why focus on severe TBI? Many t TBI survivors, primarily those with severe TBI, can face long-term disabilities. One study estimated that nationwide, 43% of TBI survivors who had been hospitalized had TBI-related disabilities remaining one year after their injury. Additionally, the cost of fatal TBIs and TBIs requiring hospitalization, many of which are severe, account for approximately 90% of the total, total TBI medical cost. I will now discuss non-fatal severe TBIs and how to reduce their consequences. Here are some potential individual consequences. Let me highlight just one, cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment or deficits can include memory loss and difficulties in planning and problem solving. This can affect a person's ability to perform even very simple tasks, such as remembering where their keys are or finding their way home at the end of the day. TBIs affect the family, the community, and the society as a whole. For example, family members may need to adjust their roles within the family in order to provide care. 
a primary breadwinner may no longer be able to work at the same job with the same intensity or even work at all. Societal factors include economic stress, productivity loss, increased dependence on social programs and supports. There are three ways to reduce severe TBI and its consequences. Primary prevention, early management, and the comprehensive approaches to rehabilitation and reintegration. I will start with primary prevention. The optimal way to reduce morbidity, mortality, and economic consequences of injuries is to prevent their occurrence. There are several avenues for prevention, pre prevention interventions presented here. Falls are the number one cause of TBI. To reduce falls, exercise and balance training have been shown to be effective. One of the challenges with primary prevention is ensuring strategies are broadly adopted. Many are best implemented through policy, and Dr. Kellerman will address these. When TBIs do occur, rapid transportation to appropriate trauma care is necessary. CDC-supported research demonstrated that the risk for death of, for severely injured patients was 25% lower when the patient received care at a level one trauma center. The guidelines for field triage of injured patients provides emergency medical service providers, or EMS, with the ability to identify severely injured patients, then to rapidly transport them to the highest level of care within the trauma system. Unfortunately, nearly 45 million Americans do not have access to a level one or a level two trauma center within one hour, either by ground or air transport. These facilities have the resources to treat patients with the most life-threatening injuries. The Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines provide healthcare and professionals with evidence-based patient care treatment recommendations. Some examples are listed here. CDC recommends the widespread adoption of these guidelines. Dr. Wright will discuss this as well. Each patient needs an individualized, comprehensive approach to rehabilitation and reintegration. This will help to ensure the patient reaches their maximal functional potential and learns to adapt to their disability. U.S. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, as you know, was shot in the head earlier this year. She sustained a severe TBI. Her ability to obtain comprehensive rehabilitation services is one factor that's led to her recovery. Rehabilitation requires a complex mix of services. Unfortunately, not every person is able to obtain these needed services. For example, some services are not provided in every geographical area, and even when those services are available, health insurance can limit the amount or type of services that a person might receive. Finally, the development and evaluation of new rehabilitation interventions, including the length of time for recovery, must incorporate the growing evidence of neuroplasticity. Now I'm going to focus on the role of public health. Maybe. There it is. Our goal within public health is to prevent TBI and to improve the identification and management of TBI when it happens. Key activities in this effort are surveillance, identification of evidence-based strategies, and dissemination and implementation of those strategies. Surveillance is important to all phases of prevention response. We as public health do have a role. Many current data sources do not provide the level of detail needed to fully understand the epidemiology and long-term consequences and outcomes of TBI. The development of a standard definition for TBI, in addition to a true national injury surveillance system, will inform prevention efforts. Longitudinal or follow-up studies will help us evaluate interventions for their effectiveness. We have a role in developing, identifying, and disseminating evidence-based primary prevention strategies. Many of these strategies recommended by CDC's Guide to Community Preventive Services are being implemented in states across the U.S. We know that not one size fits all. The multiple potential causes of TBI require multiple interventions with action on all levels. Moving forward, we need to tailor interventions 
for high-risk populations and to evaluate programs and policies in order to improve implementation. Through research, public health can address gaps in existing policies and with state and local communities can fully implement effective interventions. We have a role in the identification and dissemination of early management strategies for TBI, especially through the improvement of guidelines of field triage and trauma system development. Access to trauma care is crucial to minimizing long-term consequences of TBI. However, this access is not available in all areas. We can also support the development of trauma systems integrated within public health across the United States. We have a role in supporting the rehabilitation and reintegration of individuals back into their communities. The current evidence shows that a comprehensive program of rehabilitation is the most effective way of minimizing negative consequences. In order to support this, we need to work with partners to identify mechanisms for reimbursement that allow for increased access to comprehensive care. Further, we need to collaborate with the clinical community to build the evidence base for comprehensive rehabilitation, including linkages to public health prevention interventions that support lifelong health. Partnerships are the engine that drives progress to prevent and treat traumatic brain injury. For example, one common definition of TBI can only be reached if all partners agree to implement it within their surveillance systems. Additionally, sharing of findings between the military and civilian medical communities can inform early treatment and rehabilitation activities. Finally, federal agencies, state local health departments, and national and community organizations can cooperate to identify and implement effective prevention strategies. Public health does have a role. Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. David Wright. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lisa. My name is David Wright. Uh, I am uh, the Director of Emergency Neurosciences at Emory University in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, and I'm also a practicing physician at uh, Grady Memorial Hospital, arguably one of the busiest trauma centers in the nation. So today, we're going to talk about uh, or discuss, rather, the importance of the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines uh, and also kind of review the existing research gaps uh, for hopes of opportunities and change and improvement and introduce uh, what I'm excited about, a, a novel and potential treatment uh, for traumatic brain injury. But first I want to cover a little bit about what goes on after a brain injury occurs. The initial trauma is really only the first phase of injury. It's the secondary phase that's characterized by the activation of a whole host of neurotoxic events and activation of pathways that cause probably most of the morbidity and mortality after survivable injury. This secondary injury begins immediately at the time of the accident and then continues to occur for months, even up to a year after the injury. Now the earliest mechanisms discovered were the release of neurotransmitters, the influx of huge amounts of calcium into the cell and other ions, which overwhelm the cell and cause eventual necrosis and cell death. However, I think this slide is pretty obvious to everyone, right? <laughs> we know it to be much more complicated than that. Uh, in fact, there are multiple pathways that are activated and in this slide, you can begin to see uh, many of those pathways that are activated, including the release of inflammatory cytokines, uh, brain swelling or cerebral edema, activation of the excitotoxic cascade, uh, and even cell suicide, something called apoptosis. So it's important to recognize the complexity of brain injury uh, and what's going on afterwards so that we can better inform drug discovery and also develop successful treatment strategies. However, even with a clearer understanding of the pathophysiology of TBI and over 50 to 100 different targets available for us, we have yet to find a treatment that can improve the functional outcome. So where are we currently today? There are no treatments available that 
target the secondary cascade and improve functional outcome. This has led experts uh, around the country to examine why is this? What are the research gaps? What are the reasons for clinical failures? Well, the most obvious research gap is the very definition and classification of traumatic brain injury. We currently, or our current approach, is based solely on an individual's response to the environment. How awake are they? This categorization, or the Glasgow Coma Scale, divides patients into mild, moderate, and severe. This is crude, okay? Often contaminated by alcohol, other drugs, uh, such as the drugs that we give them. And it lacks, most importantly, any pathological link. Tells you nothing about what's going in, on in the brain at the time of the injury. This does a disservice to both the complexity of the underlying injury uh, and our ability to assess the patients. This is an example. This is six different patients, okay? Each of these patients have a Glasgow Coma Scale of six. None of them have the same type of injury. None of them will have the same uh, prognosis. So the lack of a good classification system for differentiating TBI has really impacted both our ability to assess and manage patients, but also hampers our clinical trials. We need a better classification system. Another mechanistic, or another gap rather, is our mechanistic approach to traumatic brain injury, that magic bullet. Single ion channel blockers, such as calcium channel blockers, and other things have been tried. And they actually work in animals, but when we take them to the human multicenter clinical trial, they don't work anymore. So these single, single, single pathway approaches are not likely to be robust enough to work in the human model. What we really need is a uh, multi-dimensional approach, either drugs that are pleiotropic or multiple drugs at one time. Fortunately, the NIH is now exploring multiple drug therapies uh, in their grant program. However, to me, the elephant in the room is our current therapy and the variability that's caused by it. The differences in mortality in traumatic brain injury patients across this country is huge. Somewhere around 20% to 65% mortality depending on what hospital you go to. It really does matter where you go for care in the United States. This background variability is unacceptable, okay? It is likely responsible for drowning out multiple, uh, or, or rather drowning out any treatment effect of our previously promising therapies uh, in clinical trials. Here we go. So uh, indeed, the better improvement in outcome, that 20%, that is linked actually to following uh, a set of simple brain, brain trauma foundation guidelines. Now, there's clear evidence that these guidelines actually improve care and save lives. Yet the adoption rate of these is unbelievably only about 65% in the US. So subsequently, there's still a lot of variability in the mortality and morbidity of traumatic brain injury patients. It's estimated that if we adopted these widely or universally, that we would save somewhere around $262 million in medical care costs, $43 million in rehabilitation costs, and almost $4 billion in lifetime societal costs every year. So, after decades of failure in the search for an effective drug treatment, there is hope. In 1991, Dr. Donald Stein, one of the world's top neuroscientists, and a colleague of mine at, here at Emory suspected that progesterone might have potent neuroprotective properties. At the time, <clears throat> this research actually was thought as to be crazy. Everybody thought Don was crazy. After all, everybody knows that progesterone is just a female hormone, right? How could it really help victims of traumatic brain injury? Fortunately, the CDC actually played a pivotal role in this early research. Don put it this way, and I quote, the CDC was the first federal agency willing to take a gamble 
on what many at the time thought was pie in the sky. Their initial two-year grant to my team kickstarted it all. With a boost from the CDC, Don's team initiated a whole series of elegant experiments that provided the data necessary for the NIH uh, and to get the NIH's attention. This story actually demonstrates an important link between clinical medicine and public health. Both disciplines want to reduce disease and injury burden. Clinical medicine considers the individual where public health obviously has a broader view. In this case, the CDC realized that this unorthodox idea had the potential to save hundreds of thousands of lives in the US and across the world. What Don discovered was that his female rats were performing better after a head injury. Indeed, when the rats were exceedingly high in progesterone levels, such as in uh, pregnancy, they had much better outcomes than their male counterparts and their non-pregnant uh, counterparts. And even more importantly, by giving progesterone to these animals after the injury, it improved outcome in both male and female animals. More recently, the mechanisms for how progesterone works uh, have been further delineated. As it turns out, progesterone is pleiotropic, like the drug cocktail that I was speaking about before, working at many different sites to halt the neurotoxic cascade, there provide, thereby providing some robust neuroprotection. So today, there's over 180 supportive publications from multiple laboratories that confirm Don's findings. It seems Don wasn't so crazy after all. But the real question is, will it work in humans? So on the strength of Don's lab science and others, Art Kellerman and I secured an NIH grant to run a small pilot study of 100 brain injured patients. This work was done right here at Grady Memorial Hospital, our level one trauma center. We were actually stunned at the results. Our studies show that progesterone was not only safe, it reduced mortality by almost 50%. It's important to note that this is a small study, okay? The findings have to be interpreted with caution. However, that said, a year later, Zhao et al. demonstrated very similar findings in 159 patients and also showed an improvement in three and six month outcomes. Combined, these findings were compelling, and the NIH is now sponsoring a huge phase three clinical trial called PROTECT-3. My colleagues and I hope to enroll 1,140 subjects in 31 different trauma centers across the country in what's known as the Neurologic Emergency Treatment Trials Network. <clears throat> this trial should provide the evidence we need to determine whether progesterone really is that long sought after uh, drug for traumatic brain injury. So what is the path forward? Well, we need to really urge clinicians across this country to comply with the Brain Trauma Foundation, gu Foundation guidelines for care. This is critical for not only patients' lives, but also for improving in, uh, clinical trials and, trying to have, and having the hope that we can actually show a difference with a drug at the clinical trial stage. Second, we need to develop a better classification system for traumatic brain injury. The one we currently have clearly doesn't work. Whether that be biomarkers or other strategies, we need one. Third, we need to keep trying. Yes, there have been a lot of failures, and there are other therapies that are being considered at NIH and other programs. Drugs that are pleiotropic or combination therapies are more likely to be successful. And then lastly, we need to strengthen our partnerships between clinical medicine and public health to improve prevention, public awareness, and outcomes. It's very important, this link between clinical medicine and public health. It provides not only a surveillance system to know whether our interventions are working, but also allows us to disseminate and ensure that the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines are widely accepted and used across the country. I'd like to thank you, and now our next speaker is Arthur Kellerman.
Good afternoon. I'm Eric Kellerman, Director of RAND Health. Before I joined RAND, I practiced emergency medicine. When I started my clinical career, many people thought it odd that an ER doc would have a public health degree. But it makes sense because emergency physicians see what happens when public health fails. Richard Fenman, Nobel Prize winning physicist, once observed that it takes very little energy to scramble an egg and all our science is incapable of reversing the transaction. It takes very little energy to scramble a brain too with equally lasting effects. That's why it's important to prevent as many brain injuries as possible and limit the severity of those that occur. One of the most powerful ways to do this is through effective public policies. To illustrate my point, consider the spectacular progress we've made in reducing deaths and injuries from motor vehicle crashes. Motor vehicle crashes are one of the CDC's winnable battles. The focus is justified. In addition to being a leading cause of injury-related death in the United States, motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of traumatic brain injury-related death to Americans less than 75 years of age. Injury control experts speak of the four E's of injury prevention. They are education, enforcement of safety laws and regulations, engineering, and economic incentives. All four strategies have a public policy dimension. Let's start with the first E, education. Driver's ed programs are a perennial favorite with state legislators and many parents. Unfortunately, they don't work. A review of three well-designed national evaluations found that driver's ed programs may paradoxically increase crashes by lowering the age at which teenagers become licensed without materially affecting their crash rates once they do. The study most familiar in the United States took place right here in DeKalb County in the late 1970s. Over 16,000 students were randomly assigned to three groups standard driver's education, driver's ed plus, an 80 hour long course including classroom, simulation, driving range, and on the road components, and a control group that received no formal driver education. Subsequent analysis found no meaningful differences among the three groups in their subsequent rate of crashes or traffic violations. Public education doesn't work so well either. Early PR campaigns to fix the nut behind the wheel were ineffective. So were subsequent campaigns designed to convince the public to voluntarily buckle up. New passenger cars have had some form of safety belt since 1964, but as recently as 1982, voluntary rates of use were dismal. The first widespread survey conducted that year found an overall use rate of 11% among drivers and front seat passengers. With enactment of state laws and intermittent enforcement, things began to improve. But by the early 1990s, rates of belt use stagnated at around 66 to 69%. The breakthrough came when law enforcement agencies launched Click It or Ticket, a campaign of sustained high visibility enforcement. It boosted safety belt use rates above 80%. Public awareness and attitudes changed as well. Programs like Click It or Ticket work best in primary enforcement states where an officer can issue a citation upon observing an unbelted motorist. It's harder to motivate the public in secondary enforcement states where an officer must stop the vehicle for some other violation before a seatbelt citation can be issued. Today, it's widely accepted that the best way to boost seatbelt use above 83% and keep it there is through high visibility enforcement plus special programs to reach high risk groups such as occupants of pickup trucks, residents of rural communities, and nighttime drivers. In contrast to the steady progress with safety belt use, alcohol impaired driving has proven to be a tougher nut to crack. Between 1982 and the 90s, progress was made. Grassroots organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving played a role. So did high visibility DUI enforcement and intense publicity. 
Public policies helped as well. Examples include state laws lowering the legal limit of blood alcohol concentration to 0.8, administrative license revocation for DUI, and raising the minimum drinking age from 18 to 21. Unfortunately, since the mid-1990s, rates of alcohol-impaired driving have plateaued. As a result, impaired driving still causes one-third of fatal crashes and an ongoing toll of traumatic brain injuries. In contrast to driver's ed, graduated driver's licensing laws work. GDL is a three-phase system for beginning drivers. The learner's permit only allows driving under the supervision of a fully licensed adult, typically a parent. An intermediate license follows. It allows supervised, unsupervised driving, but with certain significant restrictions. Together, these two phases allow a young driver to log vital hours of experience behind the wheel before graduating to a full unrestricted license. Now, the most stringent GDL programs, those with at least a six-month holding period during the learner stage, nighttime restrictions beginning no later than 10 p.m., and only one teen passenger in the car were associated with a 38% reduction in fatal crashes and a 40% reduction in injury crashes among 16-year-old drivers. Now, a new paper published just last week in JAMA suggests that some of these benefits of GDL may be offset by higher rates of fatal crashes involving 18-year-old drivers. Perhaps the thinking goes that more teens are putting off getting their driver's license to avoid the hassles of GDL and are therefore getting on the road at 18 without the benefit of those extra hours behind the wheel. Now, even if this is true, and more research is needed, it doesn't diminish the benefits of graduated driving licensing for younger drivers. Motorcycle helmet laws are effective as well. The first helmet law was enacted as far back as 1966, but by 1975, universal helmet laws were in place in 47 states in the District of Columbia. But after federal Penalties were eliminated in 1975. About half the states repealed their statutes. Since then, several states have reenacted or repealed their helmet laws. But one thing is clear. Motorcycle helmets protect bikers' heads in a crash. A Cochrane review found that helmets decrease the risk of death in a crash by 42% and decrease the risk of head injury by fully 69%. And states that adopt helmet laws quickly see usage rates climb to 90% or higher. Conversely, states that repeal their laws see helmet use rates plummet to 15%. And rates of fatal injury closely track changing rates of helmet use. Now, some of our biggest policy successes in motor vehicle safety haven't come from changing the behavior of drivers. They've come from changing the behavior of manufacturers through regulation. They have come from encouraging that third E, engineering. Today, automobiles are engineered to be crashworthy. Key features include a strong occupant compartment, a safety cage, crumple zones that absorb the force of a serious crash, side elements that resist vehicle intrusion, and a strong roof that won't collapse in a rollover. Initially, occupant restraints were limited to seat belts and maybe later frontal airbags. Today, supplemental side and curtain airbags protect your head, your chest, and other vital organs from side impacts. A car with curtain airbags, in fact, saved my son's life and his uh, suffering a traumatic brain injury in a side impact crash. Now, once manufacturers fought safety regulations tooth and nail, but at some point, auto execs realized, wait a minute, if the car sacrifices itself to save you, you're going to need to buy another car. <laughs> Mandatory crash testing is another valuable policy. Based on dynamic testing, new cars today earn a crash worthiness rating. Today, safety sells. Thanks to organizations like NHTSA, Consumer Reports and the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, consumers can quickly get objective information about a car's safety features and crash worthiness. 
No matter how good we get at preventing crashes, some will still occur. And when they do, prompt and effective treatment makes all the difference. Trauma centers save lives. That's why regionalized trauma care systems strive to get the right patient to the right hospital at the right time. CDC's new trauma triage guidelines will help. Properly implemented, they'll save thousands of lives and tens of millions of dollars annually. Surviving the immediate injury is one thing. Full recovery is another. Rehabilitation benefits brain-injured patients. Notable policy gaps remain. They include better evidence on how to evaluate sports-related concussions and when an injured participant can be allowed to return to play. Access to care is important, not only for daily emergencies, but in disasters. Currently, access to trauma, care, and rehabilitation is inadequate in many parts of the United States, particularly rural and frontier communities. The biggest policy challenge in rehabilitation is the current disconnect between what science says is good care, a comprehensive rehabilitation program, and what is covered by public and private insurers. Insurers say they want to fund evidence-based treatment, but the evidence base is thin on several important questions. Public policy is not static. In the current political landscape, concerns about personal freedom can trump even robust evidence of the benefits of helmet and seatbelt laws, product safety regulations, and even laws that discourage impaired driving. Funding is also a problem. At a time when healthcare is consuming a growing share of federal, state, and family budgets, it'll be hard to convince policymakers to adequately fund EMS, trauma care, and rehabilitation. Nevertheless, it's important to acknowledge how far we've come. A little more than 10 years ago, the CDC identified motor vehicle safety as one of the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. And earlier this year, the CDC recognized motor vehicle safety as one of the 10 significant public health achievements of the last decade. Thanks to smart public health policies, hundreds of thousands of people, including my son, are alive and well today. Motor vehicle injuries are more than a winnable battle. It's a battle we're winning. Thank you very much. Now, we have a few minutes for questions. And while I am in, uh, today now out of town, or I used to be a near neighbor, I have the privilege of moderating this session. So as you are streaming to the microphones so that folks at home and on their website can listen to you, I'm gonna move back over to the microphone. So I would encourage if you have a question or a brief comment, please share them with the audience. I will be aggressive in enforcing the one question rule so that everybody who has a question has a chance to ask it. Now, I know that CDC people aren't that shy, but because you are, I will start with the first question. Lisa, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit more about the CDC's Heads Up campaign. You mentioned it, but you had a lot of content to cover, and I wonder if you could elaborate a bit, particularly given the opening video. Great, thank you. Uh, CDC has a Heads Up campaign. It originally started with our materials for youth sports, and you saw Tracy at the beginning our video. Um, our materials for youth sports are designed for student athletes, parents, coaches, and we've expanded to trainers, uh, student, or I'm sorry, uh, school professionals, so the school nurse or the school guidance counselor who sees the student athlete going from one sports season to the next season, they tend to be the continual person in that student's athlete's life. Uh, we also have materials for TBI and preventing TBI in older adults through falls prevention that we work collaboratively with our colleagues in Division of Unintentional Injury. And we also do have materials on shaken baby syndrome as well. Thank you. Question at the microphone. Um, this is for Dr. Kellerman. Um, I'm sorry, you need to identify yourself. They all know who you are, <laughs> but for David and me, if you could identify yourself and for people who are listening sure. in. This is Arlen Greenspan from the Injury Center. 
And um, my question is one about policy. Um, I, I, we really understand and appreciate in the Injury and Center the importance that policy plays in reducing morbidity and mortality. However, as you mentioned, we're currently in a climate that is anti-regulation, anti-legislation, and often we're accused of being um, a nanny state when we um, suggest um, policies that are public health oriented. Um, can you give some insights into um, what strategies we can use to promote good public health policy and how we go about convincing people that this is not part of being a nanny, nanny state but makes sense physically fiscally as well as public health-wise? It's a great question, and it is very timely given the current uh, climate that we're in. For 17 years, I worked with a handful of colleagues in Georgia to defend Georgia's motorcycle helmet law, which was not popular with every single constituent in the state, but wildly popular with the majority mm -hmm. in the state. But there was a, was and is a small and vocal group that feels that their need to feel the freedom of wind blowing through their hair is more important than the need to wear a motorcycle helmet. And they had a following and have a following at the Georgia General Assembly. I had a very simple answer to that, which was I absolutely believe in personal freedom and personal choice and personal responsibility. I also like to keep my money in my wallet. And when people have a severe, severe brain injury, and don't die, or if they have a severe brain injury and end up at a public funded trauma center, the resource consumption is enormous. The disability challenges are profound. They're not the only one who suffers for that misfortune or that injury. Their family suffers, their children suffer, their employer suffers, the local economy suffers. The state's trauma system is compromised from the uncompensated care. So in fact, we all have an interest as a society, and balanced against that, the minor inconvenience of having a mushy hairdo when you get to wherever you're going is a small price to pay for the payoff. We don't question in most states in this country anymore the need to wear a safety belt. That is a brilliant brain injury prevention strategy for a motor vehicle. Wearing a helmet is the same effective strategy on a motorcycle. So my personal strategy is to appeal, appeal to fiscal conservatism because those who are typically the strongest libertarians on issues of injury prevention also tend to be fiscal conservatives and can relate to that argument better than some others. And it is a powerful, powerful argument. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Brendan Jackson, EIS officer in the Division of uh, Foodborne, Waterborne, Environmental Disease. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad. I'm wondering uh, how, what the situation is like for pedestrian bicyclist injuries and fatalities and uh, kind of what steps are effective ones that we can take uh, to reduce those injuries. Um, I'll give a brief answer, but I also want to let my, my panelists join in. Uh, pedestrian injuries have been, have been a very, very challenging area. Um, we typically, as a society, the first thing we always think about is education and left, right, left and those sorts of things to train pedestrians or to train kids is important. But by and large, the most effective strategies for pedestrian safety have come from better lighting in poorly lit areas, residential design, things that separate pedestrians from traffic flow, traffic calming measures that simply slow down traffic. Again, at the, while we have many people calling in or listening in from around the country, for those of you who are in this community know that Buford Highway is a death trap for pedestrians because you have people living on one side of a very busy multi-lane street and retail stores and grocery stores on the other side of the street, and it can be a half a mile or a mile to a crosswalk. So those sorts of challenges are very important. For bicycles, um, we have seen a steady improvement, but again, a plateauing of the use of bicycle helmets, which are also very effective. There's generally more reluctance to mandating helmet use, although I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, we do more marking of lanes in the United States, whereas the Europeans actually physically separate their bike lanes from, truck, from vehicles. That's a very effective strategy, but a costly one on the front end. So again, we know strategies that work. 
We simply have to use them more consistently. Any of you want to weigh in on that? But a good question, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Wright. Uh, David, early on when we were doing this work with progesterone and everyone thought that Don was crazy, it, whenever I would tell someone that we were exploring a potentially promising therapy that had all of these beneficial effects, seemed to work really well in experimental animals, and we even had some uh, provocative uh, clinical data in humans, they would get really excited and they go, what is it? What is it? And I would say, it's progesterone, and the next reaction invariably was they would laugh. Has that changed? Well, uh, <clears throat> I still feel like we're swimming upstream. Uh, and yeah, we, we still get giggles, we, uh, we get laughs, we get a lot of disbelief. Um, and uh, that's what our phase three multi-center clinical trial is here to prove. Um, it's interesting. If we had discovered progesterone in the brain first, uh, it is produced in the brain. In fact, it's the only hormone steroid slash produced in the brain. It's called a neurosteroid. If we discovered it there first, we may have a completely different perception of what progesterone does because it's made in the brain, by the brain, for the brain. And it only happened that we discovered it in the ovaries first and its role in the menstrual cycle. And indeed, it may be that its effect during pregnancy is to coat the brain and during the fetal development. Uh, that is hypothesized by a number of GYN and also neuro experts. It also sort of is an example of how the body uses different compounds in different places for different purposes. Uh, and it's just a beautiful example of, of the human body and, 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 uh, and how it does that. As you all heard from Lisa's opening remarks, injury in general and brain injury in particular does seem to be linked to the Y chromosome. And I think it's a cruel trick of fate that had only testosterone been the effective agent for brain injury, we would probably have lines around the block at every pharmacy waiting to buy it. <laughs> we, I think, have time for one more question, perhaps, and then we will wrap up this session. Yes, sir. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. This is questions for Ms. McGuire. You all discussed alcohol and driving and is CDC looking at the uh, effect of some of the prescription drug abuse that is, um, that, that is prevalent as well as the um, prescription medication usage while driving? Is there any surveillance on that uh, from CDC? Well, thank you for that question. Um, our colleagues in Division of Unintentional Injury do focus on um, medication use and misuse and that, and they do look at that in relationship to motor vehicle incidents, and I'm not sure if someone would like to comment specifically on the specifics of that or would like to just get with you after the session. Thank you. That concludes this session. I would like to thank all of you who are present in the auditorium, and I'd also like to thank all who tuned in on the web and over the lines. Uh, thank you for participating. Brain injuries matter. They can be prevented. We can make a difference, and we are winning this battle. Thank you. And in the light of my comment that we are going to uh, assess what kind of changes and modifications we're going to make, in the next, uh, in the third year of the Grand Rounds, we are hiring Arthur as our permanent moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much, and we'll see you in December.